What am I supposed to say? What's worse than unprecedented? We're all going to pay a price for what's happening in the Arctic. The last is really the front line. There's no sea ice, and that's really unusual. Usually you'd see the sea ice at least on the horizon by now. It's changing, um, and it's changing pretty rapidly. The ocean out there is warming up. Everything's going to change. going to be just like uh, Hawaii in Honolulu. So much of human activity takes place near the coast. A bunch of us started talking about what to do about threatened Arctic sites. This is such an imminent threat. The talking and planning, that's just ridiculous. By the time you get done making your plans, you know, the sites are going to be gone. People have been living all along the north coast of Alaska for thousands of years, hunting on the ice, using the ice for transportation, using the ice for protection against storm systems. Some of the first people that lived uh, on the North American continent were living uh, along the coast of Alaska. Now that the ice is going away, the permafrost itself, the very ground that those communities were built on, is beginning to thaw. The land literally melts away into the ocean. So by losing that, uh, we're losing part of ourselves. We're losing where we're from and, and who we are as a people. We're about 12 miles south of the town of Barrow, and we're pretty close to the most northern point in the United States. To get here, you have to take an ATV or a boat down the coast, and it feels pretty isolating. In 2013, uh, some folks reported that a piece of the bluff had fallen off and a corner of a house was sticking out. It's only four years, and the coastline has retreated at least 38 or 39 feet. They were concerned, and um, there have been more storms that will potentially take more of the site. It's essentially been frozen for, you know, a thousand years, 1,500 years, whatever. So we've been trying to excavate what, what we can. You can see all these house timbers. There's, you know, multiple, multiple occupations here. This place got had a bunch of people living here. But yeah, no, there was there was 30 some feet, uh, 30 plus feet of site in front of this. So it, it's a huge amount just disappeared. We're just trying to help learn learn what we can uh, before, before it gets swallowed by the ocean. Um, I would say probably in the next year or two, we, there won't be much of a site left. I mean, you know, everything we're working on could be gone in, in an afternoon. It's, it's going to go. There are a lot, of, a lot of times where you kind of just have to take what you can get. So it's, you know, if you're looking at a section, it's okay. We either do this now, it might fall off in the next couple days. Because you can see cracks starting to form in, in the sod. And you can see it, kind of the whole thing, getting ready to give way. So it's like, okay, we need to do this now. We have to do it quickly. We can't take nearly as much time as we probably want to but sometimes you have to do it quicker just to, either you do it quickly and you get it now or you don't get it at all. Some of us are arguing that this maybe is what needs to happen for archeological sites that are truly endangered, that there actually be a, a program that is basically focused on recovery of primary data. 
So excavating the sites, recovering you know, the artifacts, document them in as much detail as possible. It's deposited in a museum and it, you know, it may get analyzed by somebody's grandkids. One of the things you need to think about is, do you really need to be doing what you're doing? In all archaeology is trade-offs. I mean, you're, it's a destructive science. You're destroying something, and you know, you're destroying it in a particular way. And by destroying it in this particular way, you may make it so that you can't collect that particular kind of data. In cases like this, the site could be completely gone by next year. Now here, this is under threat. So when you're doing salvage, it's designed to recover as much data we, as we can about that as fast as we can. If your house is about to burn down, whether or not you like the fact that it's burning down, you really probably ought to do something about it. Where do you want to be 50 and 100 years from now? You know, how are you serving future science? Talking and planning, and this is, well, what should we do? That's just ridiculous. By the time you get done making your plans, you know, the sites are going to be gone. So what was the point of the whole exercise? Over a thousand years of continuous occupation here at this, at this one site. The level of preservation is pretty incredible. It all gets preserved because it gets frozen. This is an ivory, is it? Yeah. It is? Wow. What we essentially have here is a giant frozen tissue archive that goes through time. You'll dig up mummified animal remains just because they get frozen. Some seal hunter circa 1940 came up here. Most places in the lower 48, uh, that that doesn't happen. The, the, you know, the bacterial and chemical decay processes can proceed as they usually do, so everything rots. You have a totally different level of detail and, and totally different way of being able to look at, at past life ways and what people were doing. We're coming down now onto the structure of the house and you can really see how it's being put together and, and held up by, uh, by posts and, and whale bones and things like that. The house is incredible in terms of its sturdiness. I've never seen something as robust. So there's a tunnel in there that we had to be careful excavating. The tunnel is still holding weight after hundreds of years. And there's definitely a few, but a lot of times they collapse. It's, it's more rare to find one kind of still standing and have that cavity inside. So it's basically a cold trap. The cold air stays down, the warm air rises, so your house is, is warm. Like 90 degrees. The semi-subterranean sod house was said to have been too hot by early European explorers. The site has its challenges, you know. The mosquitoes are severely a problem. When I first got here, all you would see is black clouds floating around. So you kind of have to think about something else for a while so that you don't hear them around you, because that's really what drives you crazy. There's some slippery parts, there's some steep parts. We just simply can't access parts of without working in places that are less than ideal. So be careful here, don't put your foot on a, don't get, pick your foot on a, on a loop, because then you'll fall and die. So we probably would be a little bit further along, but we're, we're you know, plugging along here. He's big. Yeah, and he keeps looking back at us. He yep. wants to come back. There was a bear in camp. It was just after breakfast, and then people were coming out of the sort of kitchen eating tent. And luckily, when they went outside and made a lot of noise, he went away. The loss of sea ice means that marine mammals are losing their habitat. The polar bears are then having to make a choice between starving out on the ice where there's no food or swimming to shore uh, and becoming more shore-based bears. So now we have bear watch shifts. We're going to have to probably do this through the end yeah, of it's the not, week. I mean, so this is going to be like a recurring either. thing, yeah, so it's so not going to just be Yeah, so the three of us are going to be doing it every night, but... So who's going to be with me at 5.30 to 8.30? Thanks. And whoever wants to volunteer to hang out with the three people doing gun duty. in July is that it's generally before the storms start happening. We had essentially a fall storm on the 24th of July, which is way early. The storm was not supposed to happen until about October. The ice should have been here for it to kind of be a barrier. 
Barrow, they were calling for six foot waves, but they were, cl I would say they were probably closer to nine here. We ended up having to move camp, moved four tents. And then it, you know, got to, we started moving everything else. Took all the artifacts up, took them all up the hill, took all the electronics up the hill. And then started digging that seawall just to kind of keep the water back. Spent about seven and a half hours pretty well straight up shoveling, shoveling, shoveling. The waves were coming up right up onto the bluff edge and they're definitely eroding the site. So storms like that are a big problem for this site and they're becoming more frequent and earlier in the, in the season, which is, which is interesting. Storm systems can now blow across open water rather than blowing over ice. So instead of a two month period when storms can generate waves, you may have an eight month period. Things like this are able to be saved much longer. Pretty soon it's gonna start getting even worse. The people wanna know what she has. The science community wants to know what she had. This project is initiated by the local Native Inuit Park Corporation, and we're kind of here to do what we can to assist. Dr. Jensen's dig down at Wolokpa is, is a special case in archaeology where it's being funded by a Native group who owns the land. The beach down there is used as a pretty much a highway by trucks, four-wheelers, snow machines in the wintertime. Uh, so you can imagine human remains and archaeological remains getting scattered on the beach, they're obviously they're going to get disintegrated. Being that these are the remains of our ancestors and we own that land, we took it upon ourselves to respectfully take care of that site. These are incredibly valuable samples. The really cool thing about this um, pottery is that it has residue on it. So you can use new analytical techniques and find out what they were eating. Excellent preservation. You get little wooden artifacts and little bone artifacts. So this is, a, <laughs> this is a toy. That's the other thing about working up here. You start to see, you start to glimpse and the way people were living. By looking at their remains, their technology, their, their houses, it really brings a sense of pride. It all comes down to both their traditional knowledge and their local knowledge that's developed over thousands of years, but then part of that knowledge is the technology. It's a toggling harpoon head, which is one of the greatest inventions of mankind. It comes apart, so the harpoon is in three segments. There's, this, there's the harpoon head, then there's like a little small segment that is designed to kind of fall off, and then the harpoon handle. And this goes in, and it's pretty thin, you know, so it goes through the hide. And then when you pull, it turns inside. So now you have a little hole with a big thing behind it inside a very tough marine mammal hide. And then gets stuck, and is attached to a float, and then you're able to keep track of seal or whale, wherever it goes becomes really obvious really fast that these weren't some desperate, starving people eking by a, you know, a horrible life up in this deadly environment. It's almost the opposite where they're just living this life of luxury to some extent, having access to all that food and materials from the ocean. I would call it my my garden, just like garden, got lots of food. Barrow still relies uh, on harvesting bowhead whales every year. When I was a hunter, when I was a young one, it gave me uh, three whales in one week. As the ice pulls further and further away from shore, it's getting more challenging when the ice is blown away, we've never seen it back. 
Barrow is changing faster than any other place I can point to in the world right now. Those folks have been there for thousands of years. They've been inhabiting the same place for as long as they can remember. And now in the course of a decade, they've gone from community stability to nearly complete instability. Everything is changing all I'm living. This is my wife. Anna, this is me, that's how we uh, were when we were young. We don't use jacket with the zipper on. We don't even use uh, shoes. For every people, having tangible things that remind you of your past is very important. When we lose these archeological sites, because of environmental change, we lose part of our past. We lose the history of who we are. People are very concerned about their heritage. They want to preserve their heritage. There's a lot of people who, you know, beachcomb and bring us things that they found after storms, and they also deserve to have their heritage preserved and protected as best it can be. Some people lived down there a long time ago, under the ground. They they show us how to live in cold weather, warm weather, out on the ocean. If you live close enough in Alaska, you'll find evidence that people were there. I wonder if they ever thought that their great, great, great grandkids are going to be digging around learning about them, feeling that pride. This is the only way, you know, short of getting a time machine, that we can, can look back. The conditions are so very harsh, yet the people were able to live and thrive and make beautiful objects and, and do incredible things like hunt whales and figured out how to make houses that stayed 90 degrees and 70 below. It's, it's, it's amazing. We're all going to pay a price for what's happening in the Arctic. The Arctic is losing sea ice at a, at a truly amazing pace, something that we have not seen in the historical record before. Uh, you know, we see all kinds of birds in Barrow that nobody had ever seen. You know, I keep, like somebody keeps showing me, you know, oh wow, I saw this really weird bird, and they show it to me, oh, it's a robin. <laughs> it is not some faraway place uh, that is just remote and full of polar bears. The Arctic is the refrigerator for the entire planet. It is indicative of the challenges we're going to face as a country as we move through the next decade. Things that can help people, you know, have pride, feel proud of who, who they are, where they're, where they're from, I don't see that as unuseful at all. In some sense, everybody's culture is a way of adapting to the environment we find ourselves in. This is a pretty harsh environment. A lot of, a lot of folks literally couldn't make it, but people here not only managed to get by here, but they actually had a uh, rich life. Oh, no! <laughs> you can imagine that most of our sites are already and have been washed away. So Wallachia is very rare in that it hasn't. If our ancestors, whose remains that we are taking care of right now, were to look back and talk to us, I think they would, they would be proud that we are proud.